Hello, everyone, and welcome to our show Voidcast. I'm your host for today, Lenny. This is the 11th episode, and today we're going to talk about music for a change. Now, before we get into it, just my usual disclaimer. You are probably listening to us right now on YouTube, which is fine, so please keep listening. But if you so prefer, you can also find our show on other podcast platforms. Just go to linktr.ee slash vegan voidcast. Now, as I'm sure you've noticed, today I'm alone. I'm recording this all by myself because my friend and co-host Carlos is not feeling well today. So please post your get well messages in the comments down below. Nonetheless, uh, Carlos offered to take care of the editing as usual, so it's still our episode and we're still doing this together, even if I'm the only one you can hear right now. But if you don't want to listen to me having a casual conversation with myself, or if you simply prefer to listen to Carlos, just check out the episodes that he did with the Enough of the Falafel podcast. So we covered a lot of different types of media already on this podcast. Short stories, novels, movies, TV series, and even YouTube video essays. So I think it's about time that we also talk about music. And this is also a nice link to what I used to do and still do outside of this weird little vegan internatalist or pessimist uh, sphere on the internet. But why music? What does music, of all things, have to do with philosophical pessimism? Now, if we take a look at the writings of Arthur Schopenhauer, for example... We can see that a special metaphysical status is given to music and to its aesthetic contemplation, through which we are temporarily released from our slavery to what he calls the will, and the beautiful becomes truly pleasurable. And likewise, we can see that music was very important to Emile Turan too, who writes, What music appeals to in us, it is difficult to know. What we do know is that music reaches a zone so deep that madness itself cannot penetrate there in his trouble with being born. And there's an entire chapter on music in his book All Gal is Divided. He also writes, music is the refuge of souls wounded by happiness. So, yeah, make of that what you will. <laughs> However, there were also thinkers in the pessimist tradition who were not so fond of music, such as the crazy Dr. Novak Grabowski, who I recently did a bit of research on. He even wrote an entire diatribe against music, Vida di Musik. And this was actually not easy to find, but I managed to get hold of a copy. And you can now, if you're interested, find it on the internet archive, archive.org. But today, I'm not going to go much deeper into musical or philosophical theory. I'm also not going to talk about music that is made by antinatalists for other antinatalists. That is specifically for an antinatalist audience in mind. Because when music or art in general is created with this sort of ideological motive or purpose or with this kind of messaging in mind, then the quality of the art itself often falls by the wayside, so to speak. Uh, when it is only reduced to a tool to get some message across. And we can find plenty of examples in religiously or politically motivated music. You know, the kind of stuff that I feel most people listen to out of solidarity. That is, I hold this belief, the artist holds this belief, this belief is expressed in the music, and that is why I listen to the music. You know? But if you want me to actually like your music, it is not enough that you simply say the right words and do the right gestures and wear the right clothes or whatever. However, there are of course also a number of talented and truly interesting creative minds in these spaces. And I would like to give yet another shout out to our friend and regular listener, Andrew McIntosh, who not only does his excellent video essays on all kinds of things related to pessimism, antinatalism, but he is also a musician and a quite prolific one at that, mostly in the electronic experimental noise uh, department. So if you're into that kind of stuff, please give him a listen. My favorite track of his is called Oh God No. But what's interesting to note is that even some of the more high-profile antinatalists are or at least were involved in some kind of music projects themselves. And didn't even Benatar do this one called Love is a Battlefield back in the 80s? Anyway, this is not the focus of this episode. 
Instead, I was going to talk with Carlos about the role and the value of music in our own personal lives. And of course, I can only speak for myself now, but music is and has always been a very important part of my life. I'm also a musician myself, so I've played music for about 20 years now, started as a young boy and played both on my own and in a variety of ensembles. I also have a fairly large music collection, so about 800, 900 uh, records, both CD and vinyl. So yes, I'm one of the weirdos that still collects physical records. So I put a lot of time and money and energy into, you know, discovering new and obscure bands. I also used to go to concerts and festivals several times a year, both in Germany and abroad. These days, not so often, because now I usually avoid uh, large crowds of people and I don't drink anymore. That's essentially how I spent my youth. But uh, it was always important to me not to be just a consumer. So I think at the age of 15, I started writing reviews and uh, I did interviews with a couple of, uh, of bands and eventually got involved in this you know, music promotion thing simply because these bands meant so much to me. And I wanted to share my passion with other people who are interested in the same kind of stuff and help the bands find the recognition I felt they deserved. And from 2014, when I was still a nervous but enthusiastic teenager, to 2019, I used to co-host a heavy metal podcast where I presented my carefully selected hidden gems to a tiny audience of no more than a handful of regular listeners and friends. And yeah, I ended up uh, recording... Uh, 33 episodes with that podcast and I mean we put a lot of effort into it but it was always meant to be an underground project it was never on YouTube or Spotify either and interestingly ideologically it was almost the polar opposite of what I'm doing now so yeah my views have since changed quite a bit for better or worse and I think 2014 Lenny and 2024 Lenny would probably cringe at each other's views but that also have a lot to learn from each other, in my opinion. I think all things considered, 2014 Lenny was a decent bloke. And from 2011 to 2019, I also uh, created uh, a number of handmade uh, compilations or mixtapes of carefully selected and curated songs, usually centered around a specific idea or a specific uh, association of mine, which I then gave to a small circle of friends and fellow music enthusiasts. Now, this episode is called Music Recommendations for Pessimists. And I briefly considered calling it A Pessimist's Guide to Music, but eventually decided against it. Because I know people on Discord know me as the kind of person that says, if you haven't read this or that book, don't even talk to me. <laughs> but what I'm going to um, present to you now are literally just my personal music recommendations. I'm not saying a good pessimist must listen to this or a good pessimist must listen to that or spend money on this or on that or anything like this. Uh, music and also like taste in music is a very, it's a highly subjective uh, thing. And I know very well that the music that I like and that I'm into is simply not for everyone. So you are of course free to dismiss my suggestions and you're invited to post your own suggestions in the comments if you like. I will also say that I've known and been a super fan of most of the bands and projects that I'm going to present to you for more than a decade now. So I discovered them when I was still a rather idealistic young guy and actually played most of them on my previous podcast. But now that I've become kind of a full-fledged uh, pessimist uh, or fell down the pessimist hole or however you want to call it, um, I am able to appreciate some of them if not more, then at least in a unique kind of way. And I'll explain to you why that is, just so you know where my personal enthusiasm comes from, even if it is not your cup of tea, so to speak. However, since YouTube and other platforms are rather strict when it comes to copyright and copyright strikes and whatnot, I won't be able to play the songs themselves. Instead, uh, you can find all of them in the description and I will also create a playlist for your convenience. 
Now, with that out of the way, let's get to my first recommendation. Reverend Bizarre and Doom Metal. Now, there are lots of different varieties and subgenres of heavy metal. And yes, it can get quite confusing at times. And I remember um, when I was very young, I thought everything metal I'm automatically a fan of, like by default. But over the years, I've become extremely picky in what kind of heavy metal I listen to and I actually enjoy. And as a rule of thumb, you know, when in doubt, always refer back to the mighty Black Sabbath. You know, there's the saying, you can only trust yourself and the first six Black Sabbath albums. I think it was Henry Rollins who said this, and I think it's actually true. And I mean, if you just listen to the very first minutes of the song Black Sabbath, that is uh, the title track opening Black Sabbath's groundbreaking debut album from 1970, you can already hear Tony Iommi's crushingly heavy guitar waltz combined with Bill Ward's slowly proceeding beat and Ozzy Osbourne's desperate wails. And this is essentially the essence of doom and of heavy metal as a whole. As heavy metal got faster and more brutal and more aggressive in the early 80s, you know, with the invention of uh, thrash metal and other more extreme varieties, a couple of bands took it back to the roots and opted for a more conservative approach and a very slow and heavy style uh, following in the footsteps of Black Sabbath. And this was later called doom metal. So this genre is characterized primarily you know by by its clean vocals by discernible but still extremely heavy riffs and melodies an overall dark atmosphere sincere emotions and of course a direct influence of uh, black sabbath so there were bands like saint vitus trouble and pentagram from the us and witchfinder general from the uk who kind of uh, defined and codified this genre and quoting from the Doom Metal Manifesto, written by Reverend Bizarre's Earl of Void, in the first paragraph it says, The background or the moving force behind the slowness and the heaviness of Doom Metal music has traditionally been the painful burden of the human race, realizing not only the imminence of our doom, that is, both the moral and the physical decay and eventually destruction of this earth, but also the role we ourselves have been and still are playing in this. It's a dark world, as the legendary St. Vitus put it, and reflecting and dealing with this darkness was a task doom metal bands originally took upon themselves. So, and this is of course a reference to the song Dark World by St. Vitus, who I mentioned earlier, who wrote, I just took a trip into a bottomless well, face to face with the madness that's been cracking my shell. All around me decay, burning in my eyes, I can see no way to save our lives. I hear little children begging for relief. I hear all of us say, don't even bother me. Tomorrow it could be you, tomorrow it could be me. We are all in the same slimy boat and we are all going to sink. So yeah, this should put you in the mood for some true doom. Now, what's so special about doom metal thematically? Doom metal is characterized by its very bleak and pessimistic outlook on the world and on human existence. It often deals with uh, emotions like sadness and despair. Uh, there's often a, a feeling of hopelessness uh, expressed in this music. But it also leaves room for uh, religious elements. On the one hand, of course, uh, occultism, uh, witchcraft. And on the other hand, it also allows for Christianity and specifically its darker and gloomier aspects, uh, such as the concepts of penance, sin and punishment, the apocalypse, powerlessness and you know the notion of uh, puritanism also uh, with regards to, to the music itself. And we often find like this, this, this kind of imagery of cathedrals, graveyards and, and crosses in doom metal, which is really interesting because the cross is really an instrument of torture, of suffering, of, of uh, execution and death. So um, this is an important element, a stylistic element in doom metal. But but a lot of doom metal bands are also inspired by horror fiction, uh, especially H.P. Uh, Lovecraft and horror movies, uh, especially from, from the 80s. But there is one band that I think brought to perfection what Black Sabbath started in the 70s and what St. Vitus, Trouble and Pentagram continued in the 80s. 
This band is called Reverend Bizarre. They're from Finland and were founded in 1994. And over the course of the next 12 or 13 years, they released a demo, three regular full-length albums, two extended plays, two singles, which did surprisingly well in the Finnish uh, single charts, and a couple of splits and songs that were later included on a compilation before splitting up for good in 2007. But Reverend Bizarre left behind an absolutely flawless legacy and I think are rightfully considered the pinnacle of doom metal. Now, if you are new to Reverend Bizarre or to doom metal in general, I highly recommend checking out the first two tracks from Reverend Bizarre's debut album in the Rectory of the Bizarre Reverend. I think these perfectly encapsulate the spirit of doom metal and give you a very good idea of what these guys have been up to. But if that's a bit too slow for your taste, you can also check out some of the more mid-tempo stuff that they did. For example, uh, Doom Over the World from their second album, or Cromwell, which uh, was actually the first track that I heard from Reverend Bizarre, the one that got me hooked back in 2010. But the track that Reverend Bizarre sealed their absolutely flawless discography with is the phenomenal closing track of their third and final full-length album. And it's called Anywhere Out of This World. It's one of the most intense musical performances I've ever heard. I highly recommend you uh, check it out. Now, earlier I was talking about religious elements in doom metal. And Reverend Bizarre happened to be influenced both by occult writings and by the Bible. And they actually said a passage from the book of Job to music, which interestingly is exactly the same passage that is also quoted on page 132 of Better Never To Have Been. It's where Job uh, wishes he had never been born. And you can find Reverend Bizarre's musical rendition of this passage in their song From the Void 2. Now, I have no idea whether this got you interested or not. But Lenny, I hear you say, I looked up doom metal on the internet and it doesn't sound anything like what you've described because all I hear is grunts and fuzz and all these obnoxious Mariano references everywhere. And yes, you are absolutely correct. This is a well-known problem because people tend to adopt and co-opt pre-established labels and do with them whatever they like. So yes, this is what you'll end up with. But this was already a problem at the time Reverend Bizarre were around. So they decided to write a doom metal manifesto outlining both the origins and the true meaning of doom metal. And they even wrote a song called The Goddess of Doom in which they present a list of 33 certified true doom bands. So for all intents and purposes, use this as a reference, not what you find on the internet. I mean, yes, people complain about gatekeeping all the time, and this might very well be the most gatekeepy opinion that I actually hold. But if a band doesn't sound like they have an altar for St. Vitus, Trouble, and Pentagram set up in their rehearsal room, to which they dutifully pray at least five times a day, then it's not worthy of the label Doom Metal. Also, shout out to my brothers in Doom, Schwarzi, Odubs, and Nastravanje on the Cult of True Doom Discord server, who understand and share my vision and passion for doom metal. All right, I feel I went off on a tangent there. So back to the topic, pessimism in doom metal and doom metal for pessimists. And Reverend Bizarre are not the only band in the Finnish doom metal scene. There are other bands as well, and some of the former members of Reverend Bizarre are still active in other projects. And I noticed that statements along the lines of Oh, would that I had never been born. And life is a curse and things like this are particularly frequent and prominent in Finnish doom metal. For example, in the song I Am a Name on Your Funeral Wreath by Spiritus Mortis, we hear, And what is the horror of one who feels the encounter and death when compared to the horror of an unborn child who senses the approaching life? So very clearly in the ballpark of the stuff that we have to do with. And I had actually planned to write an article about this sentiment in doom metal. But for now, let's move on to the second suggestion, which is Rome and Neofolk. Now, I'm sure you all know what folk is, but what is Neofolk? It's actually not 
quite easy to define, but it is considerably darker and, for lack of a better word, weirder than ordinary traditional folk music. And it makes heavy use of samples, of electronic elements, loop techniques, and so forth. And it often has a very unique kind of melancholic mood or even apocalyptic mood to it. There are certain overlaps with adjacent genres, uh, such as martial industrial. But what characterizes this music is the unique kind of imagery it uses, that is, provocative imagery, sometimes ambiguous or even contradictory imagery. It's uh, themes which are often esoteric or occult themes. And it's unique approach to music or art in general. So there's this commitment to a certain tiny, tight-knit uh, scene of neo-folk artists, which can be traced back to a small group of very eccentric British musicians from the post-industrial scene in the mid-90s. Uh, and these guys had a common interest in things like occultism, spirituality, poetry, symbolism, and you know other weird stuff. Most notably, Douglas Pierce of Death in June, who... I'm afraid it's not related to our Lord and Savior David Pierce, and David Tibet of Current 93, the former being often credited with having created what is known as neo-folk today. And Death in June's 1992 album, But What Ends When the Symbols Shatter, is often considered to be their best and most influential album. However, there are even earlier examples of neo-folk in their discography, such as the track Fall Apart from The Wall of Sacrifice from 1989, but what really got me into Death in June back in the day was the song Little Black Angel from their aforementioned album But What Ends When the Symbols Shatter, which is a very catchy song with an interesting little history, which I'm not going to spoil for you. So yeah, there's that. And then there's Current 93. And Current 93 had an interesting collaboration going on with none other than Thomas Ligotti himself. So Thomas Ligotti published a number of books, usually in strictly limited editions, on David Tibet's label Dirtro Press, but he was also actively involved in his band, Current 93. For example, on their album All the Pretty Little Horses from 1996, Thomas Ligotti can be heard reading uh, one of his poems, Les Fleurs, at the end of the, the album, which uh, was actually recorded over the phone. So uh, Thomas Ligotti uh, usually does not do audio interviews, but if you want to know what his voice sounds like, you can uh, check out that one. And the track The Frolic from the same album is, of course, based on the story of the same name uh, by Thomas Ligotti. And one other track, Twilight, Twilight, Nihil, Nihil, was actually dedicated to, to Ligotti. So there's that. Then um, on another album, I have a special plan for this world by Current 93. And uh, this is essentially a 22-minute track where uh, David Tibet delivers a spine-chilling spoken word performance of one of Thomas Ligotti's uh, poems, poem of the same name, with eerie drones and synths in the background. Really impressive uh, performance. But Thomas Ligotti appears on a number of other works by Current 93 as well. And on one of their songs, he actually plays the guitar. But why is that? Thomas Ligotti says that he and David Tibet share a fundamental likeness in artistic and philosophical attitude. So if you want to know what Thomas Ligotti's work would sound like when put to music, check out Current 93. But what makes neo-folk so special? There's often a certain sense of hopelessness and despair and disillusionment in their music, as well as a feeling of emptiness. I mean, uh, Of the Wand and the Moon from Denmark even released an album called Emptiness, Emptiness, Emptiness. So there's that. But in addition to this, there's also often a certain kind of cultural pessimism present in the music. Cultural pessimism in the sense of the decline of the West and of Europe. But not in a political, but rather in a kind of spiritual sense, which is really hard to explain. But fortunately, a detailed study on neo-folk and its roots and its backgrounds and its history was released in 2005. And it's called Looking for Europe. And it came with a 4-CD compilation of neo-folk songs. So this should give you a very good idea of what neo-folk is about and why it's both so weird and so fascinating. However, there is one band that is notably missing from that book and that compilation. But this is simply because they were not around at the time. 
I'm talking about Rome. So let me just read the About section from his homepage, romepage.org. It says, Luxembourg-born singer-songwriter Jerome Reuter founded his multilingual project Rome, the name stems from the abridged version of his first name, Jerome, in 2005 and has since created an authoritative body of work encompassing at least 17 studio albums and numerous other official releases. Reuter's compelling brand of dark folk merges various musical influences from post-punk to chanson, from industrial to synthwave. Lyrically inspired by world literature from William S. Burroughs to Bertolt Brecht, Louis Ferdinand Céline to Emile Turan, there we go, from Hermann Hesse to Ernst Jünger, Reuter's detailed, well-researched, yet particularly accessible concept albums combine his interest in history, philosophy and the arts in a most unique way. So, in my opinion, Rome is one of the best and most able singer-songwriters uh, around at the moment, because you rarely find this level of poetic talent on the one hand and musical talent on the other hand. And this is why his music appeals to me both on an intellectual level but also on a very deep emotional level. And there are essentially three parts or three layers to the music of Rome. First, of course, the musical composition itself, then the lyrics, which are mostly in English, sometimes also in French or German, and lots and lots of voice samples in a variety of languages. So um, Jérôme has a background also in theater, in acting, and he knows very well how to create and how to convey certain atmospheres and certain emotions. And this is why he makes heavy use of these samples, which are taken from historical speeches, from old movies, from all kinds of sources. And of course, I've made it my mission to track down every single uh, reference in, in his work, which really is full of uh, literary uh, references. So every time I uh, get a new Rome album, <laughs> essentially I have a new reading list on my hands. And yeah, but he is exceptionally well read. He does his deep dives in his preparation for his albums, many of which focus on a certain theme. So some of his albums deal with historical events or certain historical periods. Uh, some deal with certain literary or intellectual scenes, others with more abstract uh, philosophical concepts. And on uh, Hell Money, his album, he also... Uh, kind of confronts his own demons and uh, thinks about his personal stuff. So, yeah, just fascinating stuff. I've seen him at least five times now, uh, both with his band and solo, just him and his guitar. And I mean, I'm a, I'm a grown man, but whenever I meet him, like I turn into this obnoxious little fanboy. Oh my God, you're my favorite artist. <laughs> it's, <just> both, <laughs> it's both awkward, but also a bit funny. But yeah, I have massive respect for, for the guy. I'm... Uh, a super fan essentially and if you are new to his music and the stuff that he does it can be quite difficult to, to get an overview of his quite extensive uh, discography so fortunately he released an anthology of the first 10 years I think of his uh, career with Rome I also created my own uh, anthology of you know his uh, his songs which I had Carlos listen to unfortunately he's not here to give you his opinion uh, of, of Rome's music which is not as enthusiastic uh, as mine of course <laughs> but uh, yeah uh, check it out for yourselves uh, just, a, just a few notes on his discography so his album Flowers from Exile from 2009 is a concept album about the Spanish Civil War, which, as you know, uh, forced many people into exile. And this album tells of their experiences, their shattered hopes and the psychological effects of exile. And it's such a good album. I'm not a particularly emotional person, but this album actually made me cry more than once. It's uh, just fascinating. And the moment I heard the opening track, uh, The Accidents of Gesture, I, I know I was in for, for the good stuff. So... Hi, highly recommended uh, Flowers from Exile. It's sometimes also regarded as their best albums, but uh, there are so many to choose from. Also another recommendation, uh, Die Ästhetik der Herrschaftsfreiheit from 2011. 
So it has a German title, but the songs are, are mostly in, in English, of course. And it's essentially a three-part album about uh, anarchism. So about its history and its ideas, uh, which is really refreshing because things can sometimes get a bit dodgy <laughs> in, in neo-folk and in the neo-folk scene. So, yeah, uh, but this one is, is based uh, primarily on uh, the aesthetics of Resistance by Peter Weiss and the Rome album actually inspired me to pick up and read that book uh, by Peter Weiss uh, back in the day. So really good stuff. Um, it's, but it it requires a lot of um, a lot of attention from from the listener, and I would say that perhaps the most like in terms of of atmosphere, probably the most pessimistic one is the track "All for Naught" from the third part of that album. But overall, I think. What might actually be his best song is The Torture Detachment from 2007. Absolutely phenomenal. Uh, I have no words for, for this song. I actually saw him perform this one live. I hope every time I see him he plays it. It's really one of my all-time uh, favorite songs and yeah, um, just, just uh, breathtaking. Now that you've heard about Death in June, which I talked about earlier, and Rome, I think you should also know about Death in Rome, which is another neo-folk project from Germany, which is primarily known for doing cover versions of popular pop songs, like um, of Miley Cyrus and um, Lana Del Rey and even Rihanna. So uh, really interesting uh, stuff and gives an interesting twist uh, on, on these uh, very well-known songs with the you know, usual neo-folk uh, aesthetic and approach. So, yeah, check that out as well if you like. Now, on to the third recommendation I have for you. Dark Space and Cosmic Black Metal. Perhaps you remember Voidcast number three, where we talked about the, the excellent movie Anyara, which is based on the poem by Harry Martinson. Perhaps you remember the existential dread and the despair of the protagonists gazing into the vast, cold, dark space. Perhaps you remember this feeling of cosmic helplessness and awe that the movie and especially the final scenes left you with. We, in that episode, we discussed the concept of cosmic insignificance, uh, which we can also find in David Benatar's uh, The Human Predicament, for example. We discussed H.P. Uh, Lovecraft's philosophy of uh, cosmic nihilism and there is a band that in my opinion perfectly encapsulates this feeling and these concepts in their music and this band is dark space which i think is an appropriate name for a band that is featured on a podcast called voidcast but that's just me so dark space are a three-piece band from switzerland and they play some sort of space themed ambient black metal and starting in 2004, they released a total of six records, four regular albums, one re-recorded demo, and a new slightly more experimental album, which was released in February this year, so just a couple of weeks ago, after a 10-year hiatus. Perhaps it's interesting to note that all of the albums and songs are untitled, but numbered instead, with each song bearing the title Dark, the number of the album, and the overall song numbers. So they've released 23 songs in total and 23 songs across six records. That's not a lot, but that's because the songs are very long. Most hit the 10 minute mark, some go well beyond 20 minutes and their latest album consists only of one single 47 minute composition. So in terms of structure, their music is more like, you know, ambient soundscapes than songs in the conventional sense of the world. They use lots of sound effects, lots of distortion, they have a drum computer and all of this creates a very otherworldly and distinctly non-human feeling. Very hard to put into words but intensely atmospheric stuff. Very hypnotic. It can really kind of draw you in, suck you in like almost like a, like a black hole of sorts. And in terms of visual presentation they take a very kind of minimalist uh, approach. I already uh, mentioned their song and their album titles. If you go to their website, darkcyberspace.com, I think you get an idea of, of what I mean. And I actually got to see them live on stage a couple of years ago. 
and I was very excited to see them. I didn't expect their songs uh, to work that well when performed live in in a tiny venue. And it was really interesting because they entered the stage with their robes and their weird sort of uh, paint and their really cool looking uh, instruments. And they almost seemed like with their robes and everything, they almost seemed like messengers from some other dark realm. And what's really fascinating is that Dark Space actually have no lyrics. So they sing, yes, but they kind of use their own language, Dark Spaceish, so to speak, which simply sounds uh, sounds like an alien language. And what they use is they use a lot of samples from movies, uh, especially horror movies and science fiction movies, as well as, you know, esoteric and spiritual stuff, especially on their latest album. And although Dark Space try to maintain some sort of mysterious uh, enigmatic aura, uh, nonetheless, there are a few, very few interviews uh, that they've given. And in one of them, they propose a thought experiment, uh, which I'd like to present to you. Choose a dark and clear night. Lie down on your back. Look out for the stars. You will feel like looking up into the sky. But in space, there are no such things as up or down. You are adhered to the planet by gravitational force only. Visualize that situation and look down into the stars. You might feel the fascinating fear to lose planetary contact and soar into the void. At least this is our personal experience. Which is kind of what I feel when listening to Dark Space. So this idea of a cold, dark, uncaring cosmos, which is way too vast for the human mind to comprehend. And... If there are any cosmic forces, chances are they are not exactly well disposed towards us. So yeah, I'm really into that kind of stuff. But it's really hard to pick a favorite here. I would say that maybe the track Dark 3.17, the final track from the third album, is relatively catchy or more accessible than some of the other stuff, while Dark 4.20, the closing track of the fourth album, is very, very intense. So in any case, I would say that their music must be experienced. Not just listened to, but really experienced. Uh, preferably like in complete darkness, not while browsing social media on your phone or anything, and uh, with good you know, audio equipment. And then it's truly an, an immersive and... Uh, incredible experience so i highly recommend uh, checking out dark space but again it's a bit of an acquired taste and this brings us to my fourth recommendation russian boomer music now i'm going to tell you a bit of a personal story in 2019 shortly after my first podcast ended i spent one month in russia in order to learn the language and get acquainted with the culture and everything but i didn't just want to be a tourist. So I deliberately stayed away from most of the usual tourist attractions because I wanted to get a taste of authentic, uh, unfiltered Russian life. And for three weeks, I lived in one of these huge grey apartment buildings in St. Petersburg. And in this kind of urban isolation, I naturally fell into some sort of melancholy. But I kind of liked it. And I came to to identify with my situation. So one day while doing, you know, my Russian homework, I stumbled upon a YouTube channel simply called Just My Favorite Strange Music. And this channel uh, had a couple of playlists, uh, a couple of uh, compilations of what he called Russian Duma music. And I was intrigued and I clicked one of the uh, videos and what I discovered there was some sort of melancholic uh, rock or post-punk, uh, heavily influenced by the likes of Joy Division, of course, The Smiths, uh, which Carlos, I'm sure, would have a few things uh, to say about, as well as uh, Soviet music. So there's this band called Kino, a very influential rock band from the 80s, you know, uh, from, from the Soviet days. And they kind of have some sort of legendary status uh, in, in Russia and are still held in, in high regard by, by people in Russia. And many of their songs are kind of like anthems uh, today, but they also did some excellent 
more melancholic songs that capture this, this specific type of, of Russian melancholy very well. And then, of course, there's this uh, synth pop from the 80s, which is quite interesting because it has recently seen a resurgence in interest um, due to what is sometimes called uh, Soviet nostalgia, which is a really bizarre phenomenon. So uh, people who were born after the dissolution of the Soviet Union s suddenly feel some sort of nostalgia for a time they've never experienced themselves. So what this music does, it kind of captures this idea of some glorious future that was promised, but that never really happened. So it allows you to kind of relive the failed hopes and dreams of a previous generation like from, from a distance, so to speak. And this is a special kind of disillusionment uh, that this music conveys. So I discovered these playlists uh, and I saw these, you know, bleak, desolate uh, urban landscapes uh, in the background. And, you know, this just perfectly captured my, my situation as well as my, my mental state at the time. So on the one hand, this feeling of melancholy. And on the other hand, it's romanticization. And in this context, it is often combined with these Duma memes uh, that are supposed to express some sort of uh, resignation, giving up on life, uh, with no hopes for the future, and so forth. But memes aside, the music itself is really good. And there was one band that really stuck out to me when listening to these Russian Duma music uh, compilations back in September 2019. And it's called Malchat Dama. They're from Belarus and play some unique uh, mix of synthwave and post-punk. And I listened to their song Ljudi Nadayeli and I was hooked immediately. I thought this is some seriously good stuff. As well as, you know, songs like Taska, Volny. And as fate would have it, I found out that Malchat Dama were about to play a concert in St. Petersburg only two days later. So, of course, I uh, bought my ticket and went there. And it was a fairly small venue where they played that night, but it was just fantastic. So that was in September. And in October, I saw them again in my hometown of Hamburg, Germany. And well, <laughs> it was kind of funny because... Uh, they were playing together with a couple of other bands and no one knew who they were, like some random guys from Belarus. But for some reason, one of their songs really blew up on TikTok, I've been told, uh, just a couple of months later. So now they have become kind of international stars. <laughs> but I got to see them <laughs> when they were still playing these tiny venues in St. Petersburg. So yeah, that's my I did it before it was cool moment. Malchat Dama are definitely not the only band uh, worth checking out in this quite vibrant uh, Russian language uh, post-punk scene. There's also Plocha, there's uh, Kanyets Elektroniki or The End of Electronics, Durnoy Vkus, Nürnberg, although they sing in Belarusian. So yeah, lots of good stuff there. And I must say that even after my return home, this music has stayed with me for a long time and for months I wasn't able to listen to anything else but this kind of Russian post-punk and I even uh, ended up creating, you know, another one of my compilations or mixtapes uh, for this experience. And I must give a shout out to my homie Simon, who I hope is listening to this right now, with whom I still to this day uh, exchange recommendations and uh, suggestions for this very peculiar kind of, of music and he actually uh, recommended one song to me that I would like to share with you. It's a col collaboration by Priznanje and Blaj and it's called Plen. So th definitely check that one out too. So these are my four recommendations for pessimists. Doom metal, neo folk, cosmic black metal and Russian post-punk. I hope you were able to find something that, you know, sparked your interest, please let us know what you think in the comments down below. Take care, everyone.